Welcome to the Central Pennsylvania Real Estate Investors Meetup Podcast, keeping you up to date with what is happening in the York, Lancaster, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania real estate markets. Welcome to the Central Pennsylvania Real Estate Investors Meetup Podcast. My name is Chad Eisenhart. Each week, I go to the local real estate meetups in York, Lancaster, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and rebroadcast the meetup in their entirety. Whether you're a new investor looking to get started or own 100 doors, meetups are a great place to connect with other like-minded individuals, including buying and selling your deals and staying up to date with what's new in your local market. I'm a buy and hold investor focused on single family, multifamily, and self-storage in York, PA, and can be found at chadbuys.com. This week, I met Wealth Builders of Central PA, hosted by Anthony Lynham of CR Property Group and Integrity Home Buyers. Anthony discusses what goes into evaluating a rental property and deciding if the deal is a go or a no-go, including the Burr Method, Debt Service Coverage Ratio, Evaluating Turnkey Rentals, Cap Rate, Commercial Lending versus Residential Lending, Cash on Cash Returns, Amortization Schedules, and more. And now, on to this week's episode. So who all is new today? Awesome. Um, so where did you guys, Ted, I know where you found us. Yeah. Chris, you came with Ted. Yeah. Um, where did you guys find us? Uh, this one, Meetup. Meetup? Yeah. Same. Same with you? Great. Meetup. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so we are wealth builders of Central PA. Um, we're one of the two uh, York real estate meetups. Generally, we have about this number of people uh, with us, um, sometimes more. And usually people come every other meeting, but we have a, we have a lot of repeat visitors. Um, so welcome to you guys that are here for the first time. Um, Wealth Builders of Central PA was started with uh, myself and Eric Brewer, who's the owner of CR Property Group. Um, we buy, set, renovate, and resell on average about 30 homes per month. Um, so this was Eric's way of you know, giving back to the investment community. We're part of a large mastermind, a national mastermind, um, really top investors from across the country. So anything that we do, honestly, like we didn't really think of ourselves. We, we um, got it from being in a mastermind. And, you know, just giving back to the community, um, particularly youth, uh, is very important to us, but also you guys as investors as well. Um, it's just our way to really give back for what we've been given. And like I said, through that national mastermind, you know, we're able to share a lot of the things that we do here. So we're going to get started. Um, what we want to do today is we want to review what makes a good cash flowing rental. Um, so how many people in the room currently have rental properties now by show of hands? All right. So, um, and I know Chad's been doing this a really long time and investors oftentimes will qualify investment properties on a number of different criteria. So I want to walk through the entire spreadsheet today and share with you what each one of those criteria means. And then know that for your investment strategies, if you're in it for buy and hold, um, you're going to pick some of these areas to focus on. Oftentimes, it's not the entire spreadsheet that you get out of an investment property, right? <clears throat> Depending on what your investment goals are, you may pick a few of these different categories to focus on. So before I get started, could anybody give me... Um, so if you're in buy and hold, what would be one thing that you target that makes a good cash flowing rental for you? Go ahead, Chad. Uh, income annually. Okay. Annual income? Yeah, net income. Net income. Okay. Anybody else? Go ahead. You can keep going. A little, a little money out of pocket after, after it's all said done. Okay. Does less money out of pocket mean more cash flow annually? Not necessarily. Okay. Does it mean zero money out of pocket and cash flow? 
So if you can find a balance between the two. Yep. Okay. So I might have you give us your criteria then in a little bit. Um, anybody else? This is right, but um, we we've been trying to experiment with like the car technique and go through that. Um, so the what technique? Where it's like uh, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. Um, so basically, you'd be able to get your money, whatever you put in, back out, assuming that um, you know it, what you uh, get a refinance for. So for us, I mean, we have, our capital is kind of, you know, more or less fixed, so if we can keep doing that, we can still keep pulling out our uh, initial, you know, funds that we put in the project. So has anybody else heard of the Burr technique? Awesome. Three quarters of the room. It's pretty good. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, it's great. Um, so if you guys have questions on that, we can cover that as well. Um, so anybody else can you think of, give me any qualifying criteria that makes a good rental. Cap rate, has anybody, have you guys all heard of cap rate? I know some of these are simple answers. Go ahead. Uh, debt, debt to income ratio, that's the only thing that matters. Debt to income ratio? That's number one thing. Yep. Um, so on these sheets, we call that, I believe, debt to credit ratio. Um, same difference. So we'll go over that as well. Yeah, so you guys are naming quite a few of them. Um, and when we look at this pro forma, the what, what this is designed for is one of our turnkey investment clients. Now what turnkey investment means is uh, part of the 30 sales that we do per month, we buy a property, we renovate it, uh, we make sure we warranty things like windows, the roof, uh, furnace and things like that and we, re, we, we rent it out, so it's essentially the Burr method, but we then sell it to an investor, um, and then we're not refinancing and cashing out. So we buy it, we renovate it, we put a tenant in place, we put property management in place, um, and then we sell it to an investor who puts this 20% down. So keep in mind, as I walk through this spreadsheet, there's some things that may be different if you use a commercial loan with John, and we'll cover that in a second. But what you're looking at here is a spreadsheet that we use um, to sell to our turnkey investors. And what we're doing is we're essentially guaranteeing them an eight and a half to nine percent cap and a 12 percent or greater cash on cash return. And we'll get to those numbers at the bottom of this spreadsheet as well. So going from the top, what you see is the purchase price or resale price of this property would be one hundred thousand. So use this as an example to just use easy numbers. Um, the buyer would put 20% down, um, and then you know they would have a loan amount of 80,000. Mortgage terms of 5%, and we are doing these as residential loans with a 30-year amortization. So I'll stop right there. Um, what types of financing are you guys using now for rentals? Has anybody done a rental recently where you put financing on it? John, do you have any examples? Yeah, I give you a pretty good overall example right now uh you're 20 percent down right now i've got uh like 4.4 percent interest uh 20 year amortization uh that's running pretty much uh what it's looking for right now and your as long as your credit's good so let me stop you there, John, real quick. So guys, I want you to show, is everybody familiar with the difference between a 20 and a 30 year amortization? So a 20 year amortization, you're gonna pay that loan back in 20 years. 30 year amortization, you're gonna pay the loan back in 30 years. So on a 30 year amortization, you have less principal upfront when you're making your payments. Therefore, you're paying down your equity slower. Is everybody with me? Um, and then if you have a 20 year amortization, you're paying more principal on that loan, but the payments are higher, which means if you get income and you have tenant income from your tenants, you're paying a higher mortgage payment yourself, right? So your cash flow now is less, but you're paying down more of the principal and you're paying it off sooner. So just to real quick at a high level, what we're talking about is 
if I have a model where I'm an investor and I want to make more cash flow, now I want to go with a 30-year amortization. And if I want to pay off more of the mortgage now with the tenant's money, then I want to go with a 20-year amortization. Does, everybody make, does that make sense for everybody? A second strategy I would share with you is that if I'm only in this for five years and I want to resell that property in five years, let's say 10 years even, then I'm gonna go with a cash flow strategy. Most likely, you know, you guys are free to think on your own and, and make your own adjustments. I'm gonna go with the cash flow strategy, right? I'm gonna pay less principal now. I'm making an investment so that I get more cash now. I'm just gonna sell it later. If I wanna keep it as a long term rental where I don't have a mortgage and I'm gonna keep it as a long term appreciating asset, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go with the 20 year amortization, pay more down on it now. That way it's free and clear for me to have my income free and clear. Does that make sense? Is everybody with me so far? All right, so, and we'll go through each one of those as we go down through this. Uh, but I just wanted everybody to see the difference between a 20 and a 30 year amortization. John said he's getting 4.4 4 on a commercial loan with 20 years. That's really good. One of the things, uh uh, on, especially in a one to four family, if you're going residential loan, you can, you can go to your 30 year. The only thing I'll just caution you, that's also gonna go, that loan's also gonna be in your personal credit rating. If you do an LLC and go commercial, that's 20 years, but that's not on your personal credit rating. And depending how many houses you buy, that can have a bearing. So has any, Sorry. Go ahead. Is that also 20% down? Yeah. Yeah, so it used to be the rule of thumb was you could only buy a four in your name personally and qualify for a residential loan. What is it now? Uh, I don't know because I don't do residential. But uh, yeah, four, I would, if I was buying, buying property, I wouldn't even want to go more than four because you get four loans the way they figure your credit, credit rating on residential versus commercial is night and day. Mm -hmm. uh, when they're looking at commercial, they're looking at each property. Uh, nice advantage I have, I've got more than one source. So, all the home you want. Okay. Yeah, I know some turnkey clients are getting more than four. I don't know what they're capped out at right now. Um, so, the, the idea there is when you get started with investing, just make sure you know whether you're choosing to put the property in an LLC, which would limit you to a 20 year amortization in a commercial loan, or if you're gonna take the property, put it in your personal name, which gives you the option of doing a residential loan. And what we're saying is there's, there's a point where that runs out. You can only put so many properties in your personal name with a residential loan. And if you're independently wealthy, they'll let you do more. If, if you're a little riskier of an investor, they're going to let you do less. And if you have an LLC, they'll ask you to do that. Go ahead. A lot of people will say, well, can I go residential now and then turn around later and put it to an LLC? You can, but you got to understand you're transferring that from your name to the LLC and you're going to pay a 2% transfer tax. Mm -hmm. Yep. So let's get back into what makes it a good cash flowing investment property. Um, we left off at mortgage terms. So we have owner's tax bracket there estimated at 30%. So I'll show you as we get down further in the sheet um, where that impacts um, your depreciation and, and what you can write off in taxes. Obviously one of the biggest benefits for us uh, being real estate investors is write offs. Um, cost recovery, that's the years of depreciation we have set at 27 and a half years. And let me, before I go any further, let me just make a suggestion. If you're gonna use these sheets and I can email this to you guys, um, or Justin and Julie, if you guys could get anybody who's new. Um, so anybody who's new today, if you just wanna write down your email address for Justin and Julie, they'll make sure you get this spreadsheet. Um, and I would suggest you only change the, the yellow fields, okay? Unless you're really serious and you know what the, these other numbers do um, and how they impact the formulas, just change what's in yellow. So we have estimated land value at 10%. Again, that's a calculation that'll affect what you're able to depreciate and write off. And closing costs is the same thing. So you're able to write that off as well. So for here, 
it's just meant as more or less a, a placeholder for what you could potentially write off um, in this real estate investment. And then obviously when you hand all your finances to your CPA, they figure these things out. Um, what we're gonna qualify moving down here further is the more important criteria, like we talked about, um, potential annual gross income, okay? So if this was a multi-unit, I would list the different units on here, um, tally them up, and you get your total operating income for the year. Um, we always use a 5% vacancy factor. So what does that mean, Chad? Uh, what you would expect the vacancy to be on a given year, on average. And on this sheet, we're using that for two things. One, so that a lender knows that we use that in our calculation. Um, we would give these sheets to a lender. Um, but two, for you as an investor, the, the most important thing is that you know that you figured out or you've at least planned for any of the bad stuff that's gonna happen. So I remember buying my first rental property and I didn't have this spreadsheet and I thought, wow, that's gonna be, you know, that's my income. And it was a four unit. And, you know, one unit went vacant. And then I thought, oh, that's easy, you know, we'll just rent it out. And then the next unit went vacant, got that rented out. Well, there's two months. So if you turn over four units in a year, like that's a lot of income, right? So the point here is you wanna estimate that 5% in this sheet, this is a single family home, but you would wanna estimate that 5% on the total gross income of the property, okay? Because what we're saying is we're gonna take that out of our projections. So this is what the house would earn. We take the 5% out and then we're gonna project our cap rate, our cash on cash return. We're gonna project it without this number in it. Does that make sense? So the rest of the sheet is based off of the effective gross income. So moving down the road here, you have all of your expenses. So real simple view, you have your income here at the top, your expenses added up here for property taxes, insurance, and as we're moving down, you have gas, water, electric, sewer, trash. And then I'll talk about replacement and reserves here in a second. So on single family homes, when we do single family rentals, the tenants pay these utilities. So they're zeros. But what's important is if you get into a multi-unit, you really have to have these correct. So um, to get away from the spreadsheet for a second, if you're out buying a multi-unit property, um, what would you need to know? How would you get this information? How would you know you have, you're analyzing the rental properly? Excellent. Yep. So Nate said, is gas and, and electric broken up? So because of heat, right? Yep. Perfect. So heat is not on here, um, but gas is. So it's important to, heat's even more important in a multi-unit than just the gas, because heat could be electric. It could be, you could be paying for an oil boiler, um, and that oil boiler could be running three, four of the units, and you're paying that as the landlord. So to give you an example, I mean, if you just plug in $100 um, here for one of the utilities and you take $100 out of that cash flow, well, the cap rate's gonna drop by almost two points. And it's just $100 a month. So the, the reality is if you don't have exact bills um, from the landlord, you, you definitely need to make sure that you have that correct. Um, there's ways to find that out. You could call utility companies. You could call uh, if trash and sewer is, is run through the township or municipality, you can call them. Um, sometimes the tenants will let you know what they've been paying. Uh, UGI will give you a reading. Um, so just make sure that when you're qualifying a multi-unit that you have the heat and other utilities, you know what those are. Um, you have those expenses plugged in here because it will mess up all of your projections really, really quick. Um, didn't want you to think that these are typically zeros. 
So replacement and reserves, again, same thing as the vacancy factor. We plug these in to make sure that we are, well, management first off, uh, when we sell a turnkey investment property, that's always included. It's one of the reasons why people buy it is because we include the management with it. The maintenance and reserves is always the option of the landlord if they want to put that into a side account or if they want to just keep drawing it out. The reason why we put it up here as a projection is because it's reality. It's because that's going to happen. You're going to spend that 5% every year. So when I come to you and I say, hey, this is a good cash flowing investment property, I want to make sure that I'm telling you that it's a good cash flowing investment property after you spend 5% in replacement and reserves. So what could you, what's an example of something that you might replace or you might put aside for reserves? Appliances. Appliances. That's good. What's that? Carpeting or yep. For when you have the vacancy. Perfect. All right, we're out of we're out of money already. <laughs> so no, I'm serious. Think about it. Um, so paint, carpet for your turn, and a couple appliances, and you ate up the maintenance and reserves. So I think the maintenance and reserves on this unit. Now this is relatively lower rents at 1095, but 624 a year. So it covers one stove. Um, now those numbers again, extremely, extremely important in multi units. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you said we're going to raise your hand. Um, all right. So what this means is we started out, we started out with $13,000 a year in gross income, which quickly became 12,483. And then we paid our taxes and we paid Nick the insurance bill. And I noticed that's dropped a lot since I took over. <laughs> um, and we took out our 5% replacement and reserves and our 6% management. So our total expenses is 3757 and we're left with 8726 pretty quick. Okay? And we haven't even started paying our mortgage yet. So our mortgage payments on this would be $429. And I promised you I would go back up and show you the amortization. So what this means is, you know, we borrowed 80,000 at 5% interest at a 30 year mortgage. And if I change that to a 20 year mortgage, oh, it's not going to pull it up because we're offline. No worries. So this would go up, John, by what? Maybe hundred dollars. So 529 a month. So just know that that's going to take out more of your monthly or your annual income because you're going to pay more here in the mortgage, right? So here's your cash flow before taxes. Here's your cash flow per month. Okay. So the way that we have this <clears throat> put in here now, 5% mortgage terms for or interest rate for 30 years, this would be our, our monthly payments. This is our gross income. And then this is how much we're going to cash flow per month, 298. So obviously I have that highlighted in green for a reason. And it's because it's usually the number one criteria that investors are qualifying on. Go ahead. Let me bring up a, another question too, for some people who may have an interest. You buy, you buy a multi-family house. If you're going to be renovating, if you're going to be renovating most of that house, you may not have that many renters in there yet. So how can you show the bank or your lender where you're going to be able to do that. If you have blended people that are interested in renting from you, get them to give you a letter of interest. They're going to rent it. That can, a lot of lenders will look at that very strongly and count toward that as far as covering you for cash flow. Sounds good. Um, so here's the equity buildup like we were talking about. So on a 30 year residential mortgage at 429, Let's say that your principal, when you start that loan out, is roughly $50. Um, well, here's your equity buildup over a year. So it's okay, so it's $100 a month. And then if I drop that to a 20 year amortization, this equity buildup would increase. Few people look at that, but if you're looking to hold long term, let's say I wanted to retire in 10 years from now, okay? 
And in order for me to retire, I need to have X number of investment properties bringing in X number of dollars per month. I don't need the money right now, but if I need it to retire 10 years from now, I don't need this $300 a month in cash flow. And if I just put a shorter amortization on that and I start paying down that equity faster, then in 10 years from now, I'm gonna have that much less of a payment. And when I go to retire, instead of having $10,000 a month in income and $7,000 a month in mortgage payments, I'm gonna have $10,000 a month in income and $2,000 a month in mortgage payments. Does that make sense? So that's the strategy between, you know, the strategy to pay down um, your principal faster and build up your equity faster. So here, debt to credit ratio. Um, Chad, you brought this up. Why do you think this is important? Well, the bank's not going to give you money if it's under uh, Perfect. Well, they might let you do one, but you're barely going to get that too. Excellent. Yep. So what are your thoughts? What do you see as the going rate? So debt to credit ratio, where do your lenders cut that off? Uh, we can go down to a credit score as well as 650. How about the, okay, I'm sorry. So debt to credit ratio on the property. When you, they qualify this for a commercial loan. They're, they're, gonna, they're gonna look at the cash flow of the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. They're going to see, want to see what the cash flow is, uh, of what the loan is, and is, is that property cash flowing? Yeah, are they going to have problems with that? That's all I want to talk about. Absolutely. Because that property has the cash flow, for them to lend money in that property. I don't care what you're making otherwise. Yep. So what this is saying is that this property, above and beyond all expenses, by itself, without a buyer in, involved in it, the property just standing alone cash flows 70% greater than its expenses. Does it make sense? At 1.69%. 1. At 1. Go ahead. To clarify on that, it means that the, this debt, the, the income that's coming in after all expenses are paid, how much money is left to service the debt? And that's what it's at 70%. Sorry, I said all expenses. The amount the mortgage, to service the debt. the debt. Correct. So the bank's not going to want to finance a property that doesn't even can't even pay for the debt. Correct. Definitely. Yeah. Claim twenty five percent above. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. So these next two um, taxable income. Thank you, Chad. Good job. Um, taxable income before cost recovery is forty seven hundred dollars. So you know, you wouldn't get taxed on the entire 8,000 in income or the entire 13,000 in income. You're gonna get taxed on 4,700. Then you're gonna claim your depreciation and after depreciation, you're actually gonna save $3,273 in taxes. Okay? So when I'd said at the top, what you claim for your owner's tax bracket, 30%, and what you, the number of years depreciation, I think that just is when you start it. Consult with your CPA, not me. But um, this is what gives you those returns. And the reason why that's important is, let's say, you know, I have a high paying W-2 job and I pay, you know, $70,000, $80,000 a year in income taxes. Um, then I'd, in, I'd buy this house and I'd save $3,200 that I get back in my income taxes. It's that simple, okay? Because you're able to claim the depreciation and have other deductions here. Um, so down here, just skipping down to cap rate, um, the cap rate on this property would be 8.73%. And the definition here is net operating income divided by purchase price. So that 13,000, um, I'm sorry, the net operating income of 12,000 divided by the purchase price of 100,000. And you have the gross rent multiplier. Um, again, people don't use that often. What they use more often is the 14.5% cash on cash return. So what that means is, is if I bought this at 100,000, I put the 20% down and roughly the 5% in closing costs 
into this deal and I put $25,000 down, I'm going to make my cash flow at $300 a month, and that's annually is going to be my 14.5% return on the $25,000 I invested. Okay? So, what are your questions so far? Go ahead. So, the, the cost recovery, the depreciation, does that matter whether you own it as an individual or in an LLC? Does that. No, you would just do that on a schedule E. Do you have experience with financials? Have uh, to be a CPA? I, I know a little bit. I don't know a huge amount, but okay. um, I have a, a man that's in CPA. Um, for, for something like that, it's normally captured on a schedule E of personal property. If it's an LLC, it's done through the corporation. Okay. Uh, yeah. What other questions? Chad, anything else you can add? Mm -hmm. If you've had it, if you've had a property for a while, now you want to refi it because you want to pull cash out to buy the properties. Keep one thing in mind: you're looking at cash flow expenses. If you've had extraordinary expenses, like you put a new roof on or you put a major uh, HVAC system in, that kind of, you've got to bring that up to a lender because that's not an every year of that expense you're going to have. So that comes out of the cash flow. So there's some things to think of when you're doing some things that way. Yeah, I think this was really good. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? Go ahead. To, to your point there, if you have that large expense, can you um, appreciate that that year? You can't depend on what it is. Uh, <laughs> a lot of things don't allow you, you want to talk to your accountant on that. A lot of things don't allow you to appreciate the first year. Uh, unless it's property or something like that. Like, well, yeah. Uh, and you may want to go over time depending on what it's going to be, depending on what you put it. So for three years. Well, uh, you want to talk to your accountant. Great, God. What about a HELOC or a all-in-one loan? Can you get those as a commercial? Yes. Okay. You can get. You can actually get a home. You can get a, a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. You would call a line of credit. You can get a commercial line of credit actually on a property you're going to buy. If I, I, I say to anybody, any any of the groups that I go to. Uh, if anybody really wants to get some answers on some financing, wants to sit down and talk, give me a call. I'll be happy to meet with you, have a cup of coffee, see what you want to do, lay thoughts out for you. It doesn't cost you anything. Do you deal with all-in-one loans? Do you know what an all-in-one loan is? It's a HELOC that's wrapped into a, a it's the same as a line of credit. We just did it with our, my personal residence. Yeah. So. It, well, you can do commercial. Where I can pay my rent. house down. I'll have my house paid off in eight eight years. So that's my thought is to take this and wrap a commercial property or my res mm -hmm. my rental property in the same thing, mm -hmm. and then do the Burr method, rinse and repeat, and then go do it somewhere else. Take the equity from that to buy the next. You, if you're buying houses, I mean, you're not going to do it in your first couple of houses. But if you're buying houses. Once you go into several houses. You want to get to the point where you're not using your own money. You're pulling money out of those houses Correct. to buy more houses. And so back to your question, or when you said about how many houses you can own, at what point do you put them in a portfolio, and can you do that? How does that all It depends that? what you want to do. I mean, you can have as many loans as you want in an LLC. Okay. Um, the, the reason, one of the main reasons why I caution people about having everything in your own name. Well, no, I, LLC is the way to go. It is definitely the way to go because it's not in your credit report. That's right. Otherwise, that could hurt you. Uh, because they figure credit different when they do that. But uh, can you put them into a portfolio loan? You, you can put 20 properties in, into a loan, depending on what you want to do. The only problem is when you put more properties with different deeds and so forth in a loan, a lender's only going to let you, or you want to sell one, a lender's going to probably want to keep the profit you make off of it to pay down the loan rather than give it to you. So when you're doing things like that, you want to make sure you have a good understanding with your lender what you're doing and why. 
And I heard that most of the big commercial banks won't do that. It's the it's the smaller. I, I'm banks. not going to deal with your big commercial banks. Your big right. commercial banks, I'm going to be blunt. Unless you're dealing with three million dollars and above, right. I'm not even going to want to talk to you. Right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's true. I, I agree. Um, good questions, for sure. Uh, and then there's, you know, especially nowadays, the financing you can get so creative. Um, mm -hmm. Things are getting uh, very investor friendly. Uh, even your local banks are getting extremely flexible on terms. So, I will you caution you one thing on buying properties. If you're buying properties in a major downtown like downtown York, downtown Harrisburg, make sure you're not buying where you're in a boarded up areas because lenders have gotten burned in the past and you're, gonna, you're not going to get a loan on that property. Yeah, there's some banks that won't even, and I don't even know that they're allowed to do it, but they've told us they won't lend in certain areas. They won't. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure, sure they have the right to do that, but. Well, I think they got a good reason because what's happened to them in the past, they rent, they used to, they used to go lending on these, and what happened, the, the kind of renters you had would rip properties apart. So they're ripping a property apart. The person that bought it is walking. The bank stuck with it, and they can't get the out with to get out of it. So they stopped and watched that. I mean, you can go downtown properties, and there's some very nice areas. Just don't go where you've got all boarded up properties and so forth, because nobody's going to loan on that in that area. But there's, so I would just be careful not to say nobody will lend in those areas. There's obviously banks that lend in those areas, and, you know, there's still financing to be had out Unless there. Unless you're going to buy a whole group of, uh, group, of, group of houses, redo them all. Or if you see they're revitalizing a section of the that's, town. That's all different. Now the time to jump Now you got something, or right. some, a new courthouse is coming in or something like this, right. that you've got a reason that, you, that you're okay. 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 Yeah, so long story short in all of that is the more people you talk to, the more you'll know, right? And the more you get more options you get together, the better off you'll be. Um, and no, I've, there's not two lenders that are the same. No. Not even close. So make sure you, you know, talk to a few. John's been, you know, grac gracious en en enough to share with us a, a lot and um, I've met with John probably three times already, so um, he's a good resource. So, and then check with your local lenders and anybody else you might know for any options. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? Make sure you guys stick around, have some food, network a little bit, um, get to know each other. You know, good connections in this room. So, um, thanks for coming. Hope to see you guys again. We'll be here uh, first Monday next month. So, thanks, guys. Have a good night. Tune in next time to the Central Pennsylvania Real Estate Investors Meetup Podcast, keeping you up to date with what is happening in the York, Lancaster, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania real estate markets.